So do you know what this thing is? Well, this is a Hoffman apparatus. It was named after Hoffman. And one of the things that it does is when we pass an electric current through water, we see that it goes through a process of electrolysis. That is, it breaks the bonds between oxygen and hydrogen in the water to produce hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. And one of the things that it confirms for us is the actual chemical formula of water. And what we see is that we get twice the volume of hydrogen gas produced as we do oxygen gas. And in fact, if we take this hydrogen gas and burn it in the presence of oxygen, that is combust the hydrogen gas, we get water again. Now we're pretty familiar with water and its formula of H2O and that it has two hydrogens bound to one oxygen. And if you've done any rudimentary chemistry, you probably understand that there is a bond that exists between the hydrogen and the oxygen in the water molecule, and that we refer to this as a covalent bond. And at a high level, we can say that that covalent bond is sort of a sharing of electrons, or even an overlapping of orbitals, between the adjacent oxygen and hydrogen. Now because these bonds exist within the water molecule, we say that these are intra, that is within, molecular, molecule, bonds. That is, these are bonds that exist within the molecule. And when we break these bonds, we see that the whole substance changes. That is, the substance that arise in these chemical reactions have new chemical and physical properties. But what happens if we take that same water molecule and we heat it up and we undergo a change that way? It doesn't actually change the properties of that substance. Sure, it's going to change liquid water into water as a gas. And if we remove heat, we can take liquid water and have it solidify into something that we call ice. But the actual properties of that substance do not change. However, there has to be something going on. Well, just like the chemical bonds and their attraction for one another due to electrons and the protons within the nuclei of adjacent molecules or atoms, we have this attraction going on between molecules as well. And the attractive forces that go on between these molecules we call inter, that is between, molecular molecules forces. So we have these intermolecular forces that exist not within the molecule but between molecules. And that also, much like the bonds that we deal with in intramolecular forces, ionic and covalent, have to do with the attractive force of the electrons for the protons in adjacent atoms and adjacent molecules. Now, depending on the nature of the molecule itself, we have sort of different classes of intermolecular forces that we can discuss. And I think the easiest one to kind of think about is if we take a molecule like water and we see that it has an overall polarity. We've already looked at molecular shape and we've already looked at the idea that there can be bond dipoles. And we already understand this idea that there can be overall molecular dipoles as a result. And water, as we know, has a, an overall dipole that goes from the positive hydrogen and points towards the more electronegative oxygen. That is, we say that this is a polar molecule. So given Given that water has an overall dipole and it can be attracted to an adjacent water that has an overall dipole, we say that these types of forces are dipole-dipole interactions. That is, they result from the attraction that exists between molecules with permanent dipoles. There are some molecules, like methane, that don't have an overall dipole. And as a result, they don't have that same dipole-dipole attraction, at least not permanently, between adjacent methane molecules. But methane can exist, albeit at very low temperatures, as a liquid, so there's got to be some attractive force that exists between these adjacent methane molecules, even if they don't have an overall dipole. And so these molecules, in fact all molecules, have these forces that exist because of the random motion of electrons within the molecules and within the atoms themselves. That is, sometimes the electrons will just by chance, happen to be randomly more at one end of the molecule than the other, and we say that as a result there's a temporary negative dipole at that end. And what it does is it repels the electrons, momentarily, in an adjacent molecule to move to another side, or the other side of the adjacent molecule, leaving an area that is going to be slightly more positive, and as a result there's a very temporary usually relatively small, amount of attraction that exists. And this goes on and it fluctuates and it occurs and it oscillates over and over and over again very rapidly. And the overall net sum of this is that these molecules will have an attraction for one another as well. And these small temporary dipole moments that result in this attraction, we say, 
or we refer to them as, dispersion forces. So these dispersion forces exist in any substance that has electrons. So this can occur even in ionic substances as well, even though we call these forces intramolecular forces, anything with an electron is going to have some degree of dispersion force, whether it be a molecule, an ionic compound, a metal, a element, anything that has electrons is going to have some degree of dispersion. Now one of the important things that we have to understand about dispersion is that it's kind of an additive force. That is, the more electrons we have and the larger the molecule is as a result, we are going to have larger and larger dispersion forces. So quite often the idea of this additive or cumulative dispersive force can be a little bit tricky for students. And what I like to get my students to think about is this idea of a hook and loop, kind of, kind of like Velcro, where if we just have a small molecule with a relatively few number of electrons, this idea of one hook and one loop, it's going to be pretty easy to pull apart. There's not going to be a huge attractive force between that. But as we start to add more hooks and more loops, the idea of the Velcro becomes stronger and stronger, and it's harder and harder to pull apart. That is, it takes more and more energy to pull apart. So if we think about larger molecules, that have many, many atoms and many, many, many electrons, even though they might not themselves have a permanent dipole, they have all of these temporary dipole moments that are ultimately going to add up to a greater overall dispersive force and a greater net attraction between these molecules. Now, in keeping with water and dipole-dipole forces, there is a subclass of dipole-dipole forces that we refer to as hydrogen bonds, which is a bit of a misnomer because it's not actually a bond as in a covalent bond or ionic bond, but it's a very strong dipole-dipole interaction. And these only occur between hydrogen and a highly electronegative element, specifically fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. That is, if hydrogen is not directly bound to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen, you do not have a hydrogen bond. So if we have this, and such as in the case of water, the attractive force of the oxygen for the hydrogen's electron is so great that the hydrogen portion is effectively just a proton, sort of opened up, and then it has a very strong attraction to an adjacent electron from a water molecule. So we can see that this dipole-dipole interaction of the lone pair of electrons for the hydrogen of an adjacent water molecule is so strong that we classify it as a kind of subclass of dipole-dipole forces, and we refer to these as hydrogen bonds. And if we were going to look at sort of the hierarchy of strength of these intermolecular forces, we would generally say that dispersion forces are the weakest, we would say that dipole-dipole forces would be stronger than dispersion forces, and that hydrogen bonds would be the strongest intermolecular force of the bunch. Now this is, of course, if we compare similar sized molecules. If we start to get into different sized molecules and different number of hydrogen bonds, then it becomes a little trickier. Now, why does all of this matter? Well, if we think about an application of this, just like some substances are going to be more reactive than others, or are going to take more energy to undergo a chemical reaction than others, some substances, or all substances, have different boiling points and melting points. It takes a different amount of energy to change one from a liquid to a gas, or a solid to a liquid. It has to do with the attractive forces that exist between these molecules. The stronger the attractive force, the more energy it's going to take. Or the stronger the attractive force, the higher the boiling point or melting point is generally going to be. And so the more attractive forces we have, the higher the melting point or the boiling point we're going to have, because it's going to take more energy to overcome those attractive forces. The other thing that I should mention is when we take a look at something like water, we know that we can dissolve or dissociate substances in water, and that some dissolve or dissociate more readily than others. And if we take something like table salt, for example, we know that water is going to dissociate the sodium ions from the chloride ions and surround them. And this attractive force is a relatively strong sort of intermolecular force as well, and we call this an ion-dipole force. Now what you'll notice is that the water molecules orient themselves in such a way so as that the negative oxygen end surrounds, or is closest to, the positive sodium ion, and that the positive hydrogen ends of the water molecule, so to speak, orient themselves around so that they are closest to the negative chloride ion, and they actually can separate these ionic substances in water. In fact, this ion-dipole force, this ion-dipole attraction, is what causes or aids in the dissociation of these soluble salts in water.
So while it should be noted that there are other intermolecular forces that exist, for our purposes, at least in introductory chemistry class, we're going to focus on these four. The dispersion forces, which exist between any molecules that really have electrons. The dipole-dipole forces, which exist between any molecules that have a permanent dipole. The hydrogen bonds, which themselves are just a special class of dipole-dipole forces and can only occur when we have a substance that has a high electronegativity, fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen, bound directly to hydrogen. And of course, the last one being the ion dipole force, which exists between the molecules that have a permanent dipole and ions in an ionic substance. So hopefully this video serves as a quick outline and introduction into these intermolecular forces. Thanks for watching.